In this short video, we're going to look at some functions which we can represent as power series. Let's start with a simple example we've seen before, that the function 1 over 1 minus u can be written as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of u to the power of n, provided that the absolute value of u is less than 1. This is just a geometric series. And we call this power series a power series representation of the function f of u equals 1 over 1 minus u. And we can use this function as a starting point. And we're able to find power series representations of a rather large number of functions. We need to use some techniques from algebra and from calculus to help us along the way. So one example would be just to make a change of variables. Replace the u with some expression of x, and then you'll have a power series in that expression of x raised to the power of n, and the interval of convergence would be, well, the absolute value of that expression in x would need to be less than 1. So here's an example. Let's find a power series representation for g of x, which equals 1 over 1 plus x squared. Remember, we know a power series representation for 1 over 1 minus u. So we're going to rewrite 1 plus x squared. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm going to rewrite 1 plus x squared as 1 minus negative x squared. And so now I've got 1 over 1 minus negative x squared. That looks like 1 over 1 minus u, where u equals negative x squared. So a power series representation of 1 over 1 plus x squared would be the summation n equals 0 to infinity of negative x squared all raised to the power of n. Now I can break that negative sign out as negative 1 to the power of n and using a properties of a property of exponents I can say x squared to the power of n is the same as x raised to the power of 2n. Now remember our limitation here this says that the absolute value of negative x squared must be less than 1, which would say that x squared is less than 1, uh, which is a, gives us the same interval in this case. The absolute value of x has to be less than 1. So a power series representation of g of x would be the summation n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the power of n, x to the power of 2n, provided that the absolute value of x is less than 1. Let's look at another example. We'd like to find a power series representation of h of x equals 1 over 2 minus x. So again, remember, the form that we know is 1 over 1 minus u. So the issue that we have is the 2. So we'll write 1 over 2 minus x as 1 over 2 in parentheses 1 minus x over 2. And that factor of 2 in the denominator will factor out as a factor of 1 half on the entire fraction. And now it looks like 1 over 1 minus u, where u equals x over 2. So we can go ahead and say that 1 half times 1 over x over 2 is going to be 1 half times the geometric power series in x over 2. And I can actually then multiply the 1 half into the power series because x to the n I'm sorry, x over 2 to the n is x to the n over 2 to the n 
If I multiply 2 to the n times 1 more 2, I'll get 2 to the n plus 1. Uh, I think, just think it's a little bit easier or easier to work with when everything is inside the summation. Sometimes it's easier to keep something outside, but certainly a multiplier like that, when I have the same base, I have 2 and then 2 to the power of n, it's tidy to multiply it into the series. And remember, our restriction would then be that the absolute value of x minus 2 would be less than 1, which means the absolute value of x would be less than 2. And that gives us our power series representation for h of x. Let's do another example. Here, uppercase f of x is x cubed over 1 minus x squared. This one is actually simpler than it might look at first because I can factor out the x cubed. This seems a little strange because I can't factor out x cubed from an integral or from a derivative. Um, but I can here because my index of summation is n. It's anything that contains an n that can't come out in front. But anything that only contains x can be factored out of the summation. So I can write 1 over 1 minus x as our geometric series, the sum n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power of n. And then I have outside the summation, I have the x cubed, which now I can multiply back into the series. I have the same base, and so I'll just add the exponents. And I still have the limitation that the absolute value of x should be less than 1. And that gives us our power series representation. Another way that we can get a power series representation by leveraging some of the examples that we've already seen is to use differentiation and integration. You can differentiate a power series term by term. In fact, this is really one of the, the most beautiful things about power series is that they look like polynomials with infinitely many terms, but finding the derivatives and antiderivatives is just a matter of applying the power rule. Now, what happens to the radius of convergence? It does not change. What about the interval of convergence? It might change. So if we're asked to find the interval of convergence, we just simply have to go back and check both endpoints again to see if the interval of convergence changes after differentiating or integrating. So if you have a power series and you want to take its derivative, well, if we write it out or expand it out, we would just apply the power rule to each term, and the derivative of the very first term, which is a constant, would be 0. And so I can apply the power rule just to the formula inside the summation notation. But when I do, I have to bear in mind that the constant term, it has the derivative of the constant term is 0. So now my index of summation no longer starts at 0. It's going to start at 1. And so inside, I just said, oh, what's the power rule? Subtract 1 uh, from the exponent, multiply in front by the original exponent. And I can do that, but I just have to remember to, to increment this starting index because there's no longer a constant term, or I'm sorry, the derivative of the original constant term is zero. And we can also integrate a power series term by term, so using the power rule. Again, the radius of convergence does not change, but the interval of convergence might. And when you do the integration, don't forget this plus c, constant of integration. 
So let's find a power series representation of g of x, which is 1 over 1 minus x squared. So how is that connected to our original 1 over 1 minus u? Well, the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x turns out to be 1 over 1 minus x squared. You don't have to apply the power rule and the chain rule. Applying the power rule gets you a negative 1 in front, but then applying the chain rule gets you another multiplier of negative 1, and that's why your final derivative just has positive 1 over 1 minus x in parentheses squared. All right, so why don't I take the derivative then of the power series representation of 1 over 1 minus x. And I can just apply the power rule, but I have to remember to increment my index here by 1. And I have the same radius of convergence. So here, in this example, we're going to do two things. We're going to first find a power representation, power series representation of the arctan function. And then we want to use that power series representation to approximate the value of arctan of 1 half. And we'd like to have it within 10 to the minus 4 of the exact value. So one step at a time, let's find the power series representation. So recall that the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is the arctan function, plus some constant. Now, previously, in another example, we found a power series representation of 1 over 1 plus x squared. It was the summation n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n times x to the power of 2n, provided that the absolute value of x is less than 1. So why don't I take the antiderivative of that power series? I'll still need to find that constant of integration, but let's start by working out the antiderivative of the power series. Well, we can do that one term at a time, just applying the power rule. I'm going to take 2n and add 1 to get the new exponent, and then I'll divide by 2n plus 1. Now, what's that constant c here? Well, since arctan of 0 equals 0, if I put 0 in for x, on this left-hand side, put 0 in for x on the right-hand side. I'll have 0 plus c equals the summation of a bunch of zeros, and that tells me that c has to equal 0 as well. So that's our power series representation for arctan. And note, this is an alternating series. So if we go back and look at our notes from alternating series, one thing that we were told when we looked at the alternating series test was that the remainder satisfies the inequality, that the absolute value of the remainder is less than the next term in the alternating series, the absolute value of the next term, because the b sub n is the series terms, the part of the term that doesn't have the negative 1 and positive 1 going back and forth. So it really just means look at the absolute value of the next term of the series. So we have an alternating series here. So our nth partial sum would be taking the sum from k equals 0 to n of the terms of the series. And the bn plus 1 would be everything except for the negative 1 to the n. So, and we put in n plus 1. So 
I'd have two parentheses n plus one plus one over two parentheses n plus one, and then outside the parentheses a one. So we would like to have that. We'd like to find the value of n where b sub n plus one evaluated at x equals one half is less than 10 to the minus 4. Then we'll be assured that our approximation uh, is within 10 to the minus 4 of the exact value. So I can't solve this expression for n. Um, so we'll just make a table of values. I went ahead and went from uh, 0 to 5. Um, I didn't expect, you know, uh, n sub 1 to give me a, a tiny value. Uh, but already at um, when n equals 4, so this would be the fifth term in the series, right? Or n corresponding to b sub 5. It actually be the sixth term in the series because it, our index starts at 0. I can see that the next term is smaller than 10 to the minus 4. So I'm going to add up then um, the first, all of the terms up to uh, 2.17 times 10 to the minus 4. So that would be the first four terms because I know the fifth term in absolute value is smaller than 10 to the minus 4. And we're going to stop there, and we'll make another video with uh, more examples.